A lot of people don't know this, but Ryan has some sort of technology called a radar that helps him keep track of current events. <laughs> Ryan, what, what is on your radar today? We call this a radar. Do they, do they even still use radar anymore? Um, so <laughs> my on my radar today is is Joe Manchin. And, and Emily, Emily, I know that over the last year and a half or so, you had a lot of doubts about good old Joe Manchin of West Virginia. And you were worried that perhaps the coal business that he owns might lead him to put personal profit in front of salvaging a verdant planet for future generations. But it seems like your doubts were misplaced. Joe Manchin <laughs> came through big time this week with one of the most stunning announcements of a deal in congressional history. Manchin, after all, had said that he was done with this bargaining, and yet here we are. Now it could still all fall apart, but with Manchin on board, the House centrists have nowhere to run, and all Democrats need now is cinema and for everybody to get over COVID and show up to vote. But how Manchin and Chuck Schumer did this is quite a wild story, and it deals a huge blow to the myth that Mitch McConnell has built around himself as some kind of master of the Senate. So let's go back to June 30th, when McConnell got cocky and set all this in motion. He tweeted, let me be perfectly clear. There will be no bipartisan USICA as long as Democrats are pursuing a partisan reconciliation bill. Now, USICA is a bipartisan bill aimed at bringing semiconductor manufacturing capacity onto American shores because we finally realized that having China and Taiwan have a monopoly on the building blocks of the modern economy might not be such a great idea, especially as China eyes completely taking Taiwan over. Now, McConnell supports this CHIPS bill, but he was saying he'd tank it if Manchin didn't stop trying to cut a climate reconciliation deal with Schumer. Now, Manchin responded by saying it was, quote, so wrong for McConnell to make that threat. Quote, I'm not walking away if anybody's going to threaten me or hold me hostage if I can help the country, he said. And if they want to play politics and play party politics, shame on them. So uh, Manchin added that it was, quote, so wrong that uh, of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky to issue threats to sink the bipartisan use legal legislation, which would boost federal investment on emerging technologies, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought at the time that McConnell was playing with fire here because Manchin nurses a grudge against Mitch for needlessly cutting him out of the Trump tax cut negotiations, as we reported at The Intercept, based on audio of a private meeting he held with no labels. So I actually wondered two weeks ago if McConnell might inspire Manchin to actually get a deal done by being such a jerk about the chips bill. After all, the threat is obscene. He's going to undermine U.S. competitiveness against China and vote against a bill he likes because he's mad about a different bill. But within days, days of that threat, Manchin announced he was walking away from the talks and he offered the White House a smaller deal instead. He would do he would do prescription drug pricing reform and he'd extend Obamacare subsidies for a couple years, but that was it. The White House instantly took the deal. Now talks on the chips bill resumed, but Manchin was hammered for backing out of the climate deal with Democrats putting the collapse of the entire planet at his feet. The next day, he was telling a West Virginia radio station he wasn't really backing away. He just wanted to make sure that whatever he did didn't add to inflation. It's not clear when, but pretty soon, private talks with Schumer started up again. The new bill was named the Inflation Reduction Act because everything in it really does fight inflation. And Manchin had been roundly mocked for saying he walked away from the deal over inflation concerns. In a private meeting with Larry Summers, Summers let him have it. And Larry Summers doesn't sugarcoat things. That must not have been fun for Manchin. So on Wednesday, the Senate passed the CHIPS bill at 12.30 p.m. At 4.30, Manchin and Schumer announced their deal. How did Republicans respond? By taking out their fury on a bill that would expand health care coverage to veterans who got cancer from burn pits, a bill they had previously voted for overwhelmingly. And they never explained how it was the veterans' fault that Republicans got played. But John Stewart, who's been a genuine champion of veterans and first responders who've been cast off by our system, explained it here. America's heroes who fought in our wars, outside sweating their asses off with oxygen, battling all kinds of ailments, while these mother sit in the air conditioning, walled off from any of it. They don't have to hear it. They don't have to see it. They don't have to 
understand that these are human beings. Do you get it yet? Do we see that these, are, these aren't heroes? These are men and women, mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers. That we just let stand outside in the heat when they can't breathe. And later in that clip, he says, uh, if this is what um, we mean by America first, then we are screwed. He didn't say screwed. Uh, I think that this veterans bill will come back to the floor when uh, the, the temper tantrum is over and they will and they will pass it because I said they passed it. Oh, more, something like 84, 85 senators voted for it the last time through it. There had to be some technical fix and then they then they tanked it because they were so furious. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious where you stand on this this McConnell question. Are you in the Rachel Bovard camp that uh, that McConnell's uh, gen so, so-called genius has always been overrated and this kind of ex exposes it? Or do you think that uh, Democrats just outplayed a, a good tactician and they just played a better game? I'm absolutely in the Rachel Bovard camp on almost everything, but uh, particularly on this. And it's hard to send, sort of say that in the context as somebody who's anti-abortion um, and is celebrating the decision in Dobbs and Mitch McConnell did um, obviously maneuver a bit to get the Supreme Court uh, majority as it is right now. That said, um, Rachel always talks about how McConnell gets a lot of credit for basically just being really good at doing nothing. Uh, and she says being good at doing nothing isn't exactly a skill. And what we're seeing here is when it requires some sort of skill, um, this isn't the only test of you know, Mitch McConnell's skills. I, I don't think he's a bad tactician. I think it's just this idea that he's cocaine Mitch, um, which goes back to that Don Blankenship uh, ad from years ago uh, that they sort of appropriated and turned into a joke that treated him as, as some sort of hero. I think that's completely overrated. And this is a good example of just a, a banal loss um, on something. Like, also, it wouldn't if McConnell is looking for an out on that bill, um, somebody whose wife's family has extensive business in China and a very good relationship with the Chinese government, that doesn't really surprise me either. So, I, I mean, I, did he get outmaneuvered here? Yeah, I think so. But how much did he actually want that legislation anyway, I think is an open question, too. Mm. And the irony here is perhaps if he'd have said nothing, uh, he'd have been in better shape. So. You know, in other words, if he would if he would not have kind of peaked uh, Joe Manchin, if he wouldn't have made that threat and he would have just allowed you know, Manchin and Schumer to continue their kind of hapless negotiations that have been going on for 18 months, it's possible that that would have, uh, you know, that that would have been a better result for Republicans. Instead, it might have actually galvanized Manchin a little bit to actually make a deal. And now Susan Collins is out saying that Republicans are so angry about uh, getting humiliated here that they might not even vote to codify marriage equality anymore. And which I think is gonna be very hard to explain to people. Like we took an L and, and we're so sore about it that, that the Senate voted by, you know, let's say they do vote, Senate voted by a majority to pass something that we didn't like, uh, that now we're going to vote against things that we otherwise would support. Like, I don't, know how long uh, they can kind of rally public support behind that that explanation. Do you? No, that won't be a popular explanation at all. And it's <laughs> one of those interesting uh, sort of discrepancies between the machinations of Capitol Hill and how average people interpret it. And that makes it difficult for senators who want negotiating power, or members of Congress who want negotiating power and like understand rightfully that it's important to be tough and to stand firm um, and say, you know, we're not going to be tricked or lied to, et cetera, even though they both do it to each other. They'll, and they know that. They know that. And Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer both know that they're pulling the rug out from each other, um, mm -hmm. pulling, pulling the rug out from under each other whenever they have the opportunity. It's just a, it's a gentleman's agreement. Uh, but that t to normal Americans, it's just frustrating, exasperating games. Um, and mm -hmm. nobody has any patience for that right now when we are in a recession and dealing with all kinds of different problems across the board. Um, it's just nobody is going to have patience for that excuse whatsoever. Yeah. And, and maybe if I'm going to give points to Republicans here, it would be it's admirable the way that they always seem to behave as if they're in the majority. Like Dem Democrats, even when they control the House, the Senate, and the White House, 
are often oftentimes act like they're actually in the minority, just kind of throwing their hands up and being like, well, that darn filibuster or gee, uh, you know, the, the parliamentarian would we'd really love to do these things, but we just can't. Whereas Republicans, even when they're in the minority, you know, have the husband to say, no, we're calling the shots here, which McConnell did there, just comes straight out and says, you, the majority, are not going to do a climate reconciliation bill. And if you do, then you're also you're not going to do this chips bill, which is just kind of impressive. <laughs> like, uh, now, it didn't it, it backfired this time on him. But the, the, the sense that he has of, of his own power uh, as as somebody like watching, you just have to be like, wow, where's where's this guy get the idea that in the minority you, you get to you get to call all these different shots if you don't want to do a a climate reconciliation bill, then you take take the majority of the Senate and and then you you can do whatever you want. Uh, and at the same time, though, Schumer never agreed. Manchin flatly rejected the deal. So, right. you know, told him, you don't you don't call the shots here. Like you don't right. tell us what we can do and what we can't do. And so that's what makes the victimization that came later, the, the sense of betrayal that came later, so much funnier because there was no betrayal because there was no deal. You yeah, know, McConnell they, like made a demand, the demand was rejected, and then later when the demand was not met, he's like, "This is an outrageous betrayal." Yeah, they they, they sort of foolishly tweaked the notoriously fragile mansion, and then sincerely <laughs> seemed to be um, seemed to be in a sense of disbelief that the rug was pulled out from <laughs> under them, which is absurd. I mean, they really seemed to think that this maneuver had been successful, um, and that they had. I mean, it's just it, it all looks very. It looks very bad uh, from the perspective of the the master tactician. Yeah, and they could have learned from the progressive caucus that you know, yes, held up the exactly. infrastructure bill for so long, and, and he was like, "Fine, I'm walking away." Yeah, a hundred percent. I was thinking that while you were talking. Yeah, yeah they should have. The, the, Mitch, Mitch, cocaine Mitch should have talked to AOC. <laughs> yeah, AOC would have it would have told him, "Hey." Just sit back and just let this guy do what this guy's going to do. It's this impossible. Schumer guy, you, you yes. can't really trust him. <laughs> yes. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, well, well, here we are. So we'll see where it goes. Here we are. Here we are. We'll be back also with... Times. What, what was that, right? No, just uh, we're, we're, these are these are some interesting times. These, that's for sure. Well, it's always interesting when you have 50-50, uh, basically, in the Senate. When you have mm -hmm. the, like such a close balancing act, the way they interact with each other, it's just it, it's fascinating from the perspective of people who are interested in politics, but um, often sort of frustrating in the the Madisonian sense, watching our our government try to work. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Well, we'll be back with more Rising Fridays coming up.